Well, welcome to College of Complexes. This is our 393rd meeting since we started in February of 2009. We put a speaker on every week a different subject. We require a speaker to take a position on an issue or express a point of view. That before or against something, we don't care what it is. We give an hour to make a presentation. If anybody erupts the speaker, we might interrupt or we listen only one fool at a time. It's one of our roles. Then we have questions and answers from the audience on speeches. Then we have remarks, rebuttals, everybody in this audience that wants to get five minutes at the podium here to respond to the speaker said for or against. The speaker gets the last four, gets a comment, a comment, and close the meeting. That's how it works. But we don't pay our speaker. Um, we, uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> I got, a, I, got a, I got a frog in my throat or something. Anyway, uh, before we before we introduce our speaker, we have announcements. Anybody have any announcements they want to make? Now's the time to do them. Oh, I guess I'll do All right, come on up here, Jim. Christmas, happy whatever you're going to be celebrating here between the time we meet tonight and we crank it back up in January. We're really pleased to have all of you out tonight on a cool, nasty, cruddy Texas evening, you know. Here it's been uh, spring all week and, well, it's been sort of up and down though, hasn't it? Crazy weather, kind of hard to know how to lay out your clothes the night before unless you watch the news. Uh, just my quick reminder tonight for all of you, whether you're first timers or old timers, uh, we really appreciate the hospitality of Romos and having us in here. Uh, we don't pay rent on the room. We promise to buy our food. And uh, I know all of you enjoy the food or you wouldn't be coming. Um, we put our little three dollars in the bucket to Tom and he feeds the speaker and uh, pays for his printing costs and ends up in the red so he subsidizes it. So we appreciate uh, what he does for the group. He doesn't get up and broadcast that but I'll say it. <laughs> um, be kind to our servers. Give them a good tip. and. Uh, you know, pretty simple rules of operation, really. It's all worked so smooth, and uh, we're so glad all of you came out tonight. Welcome to all of you, and uh, let's enjoy our speaker tonight. He's going to talk about a good subject tonight. It'll be interesting. Um, I've studied and read on that subject a lot, and being a more years than I want to own up to, Dallas resident, I've seen a lot of what's occurred in our business community. And it's always a fascinating subject. Uh, what he says in his introductory remarks in the uh, brochure are all very, very true. And for an outsider who doesn't do any analysis on it, it's a bit of a challenge to understand why this patch out in the prairie on a creek we call a river uh, has managed to do what the Dallas-Fort Worth metropolitan area has done in accumulating about seven million people in a very, very diverse, prosperous economy. We don't have the Mississippi River like St. Louis does. Uh, we don't have Lake Michigan like Chicago does, where Tom and Susan came down from. Uh, we're just a patch in the prairie. But uh, we're very fortunate to be here where we are in the center of the country. And we've had some innovative people who our speaker will teach us about tonight. Uh, we'll have some more appreciation for our city, I think, when he finishes up. So we're really looking forward to it tonight. Thanks again for coming. Any other announcements? <laughs> 
Well, the only other announcement I have is we have a uh, we have a Black Forest cake. Uh, we do this once a year, so save room for dessert because uh, when the speaker is done, we'll have dessert. And uh, there's a Black Forest cake out there. It'll be carved up, and everybody can have what they want of it. So don't forget that. Anyway, our speaker tonight is, as Jim mentioned, is Paul Benson, who's professor of humanities at the Mountain View College. He's going to talk about why Dallas, untangling the mystery of Dallas's rise to prominence. He'll discuss how it is it plays a mystery to why Dallas has risen to become one of America's most important cities. He will argue that Dallas is not on, on a main body of water like Chicago or LA. It was, it, it, nor was it a capital, nor did it have a major state university. Paul also points out that Dallas weather is no particular. Is, is not particularly temperate. <clears throat> it has no dominant industry and is not blessed with any abundance of mutual resources. He raises the question, why did Dallas have, made, have it made better than, in, than say, Denton, Dennis and Denton or Decatur? Yeah. Paul will conclude on unraveling this puzzle to, to bring light to a peculiar alignment of special people, groups, and coincidences and luck. So without further ado, please give a very, very warm welcome to uh, Paul Benson. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. It's uh, wonderful to be back. Uh, it's about my fourth or fifth time. Always enjoy it, enjoy the discussion. Please, uh, those of you that are turned, uh, take the moment here to turn your chairs around so you can uh, nothing worse than a, a, a neck that's gotten stretched out of place <laughs> by trying to hear the speaker, right? So feel free just to get up and... Uh, Rotate. Yes, please. I want to tell you a little story about how I got so interested in this topic. On January 1st, 2000, I woke up and I was... Um, you know, it was New Year's Day and not much to do. And I thought I'd go down to 7-Eleven and get a newspaper. Now, what I was interested in is this hysteria that had been going on for about a year and a half about something called Y2K. <laughs> it had these news programs and special features on Y2K and how the whole the United States economy was just going to totally collapse because it was all run by computers and the computers would be um, all falling apart because they couldn't calculate the year 2000. So I thought, well, we've heard how bad it's going to be. I wonder if there's anything in the news about it. And so consequently, I went down and, and got a Dallas Morning News looking for uh, something about Y2K. By the way, I've never heard anybody say Y2K after January 1st, 2000. <laughs> it's like it never Man. happens. It would just disappear. Well, anyway, I started looking through the paper and I discovered the most amazing thing in that paper uh, that just knocked me out. I spent almost the rest of the day reading it, and that is the Dallas Morning News went to the trouble of reprinting the entire 12-page edition of the January 1st, 1900 uh, a, a edition of the Dallas Morning News. And boy, did this get my attention. Let me, first of all, tell you, uh, my, my uh, up until that point, I'd always kind of thought of Dallas as a place that didn't take off until air conditioning came in. And air conditioning, you know, people always say, you know, Texas was, you couldn't live here. The, uh, the, they, they had a, uh, the British had an embassy, not an embassy, a consulate in Houston. And you get, you got, if you were stationed there, you had, uh, you got compensated for, you know, the rotten climate and that kind of thing. And, um, and, and I always had this kind of illusion that it was World War II, you know, air conditioning came in. By the way, just trivia, but does anybody know here what building in Dallas, what major public building 
uh, I should say, a major um, building in Dallas where people, large numbers of people congregated, was air conditioned. You want to take a guess? Go ahead. Uh, I, a little too late, North Park. Well, North Park, oh, yes, That's much, much no. later, <coughs> 1960s, yes. I'm guessing the markets were fine. That's a very good guess. And uh, they, they were early, but the very earliest, in the 1920s, if you can imagine, was First Baptist Church, oh. Dallas, Texas, <laughs> George Truett, pastor. And they did it with huge blocks of ice and fans, and they could cool that, that old red brick building down, which uh, is the only thing left down there of the, of the old uh, First Baptist operation. They, I don't know if you've been down there in recent years, but they built these Las Vegas-style fountains, right? They go off everywhere, and they, they put one of these uh, underwater elevators, so if you wanted to be baptized with the fountains going on, they would, you can just step in there, and then it just drops you slowly down, 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 down uh, you know, to, uh, to the music, how great they are, or whatever. And so, yeah, technology even came to the Baptists, right? So anyway, I was looking at this paper. By the way, I, I got so hyped up about this. I, I uh, 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 what do you call this material? Laminate. Laminate, yeah. I laminated and laminated. Bread. And so I can, I can study this. And I started looking at things here. And the first thing I noticed, it's, it says Sanger Brothers. Of course, we all know that Sanger Harris, which is now El Central College. And I thought, well, Sanger Brothers were here. Now, this is a very important detail. The Jewish community in Dallas has yep. always been very strong and very involved in business. And, All the retail. And, and uh, yeah, dominated in retail in Dallas. Very importantly so. So you have the Sanger Brothers. Right below the Sanger Brothers, you have one that some of you might remember called E.N. Khan. Yep. K-A-H-N, Khan. Now, Khan... Uh, his, this is the Khan wow, Senior. Uh, Khan Junior, Eddie Khan, is a saint among us that work in the community college because it was Eddie Khan who uh, was the driving force to get an election to create the Dallas County Community College District. So Eddie Khan's here. And I'm looking at this New Year's greetings, you know, from this company and that. And I come down, 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 and here I see in big black letters, Dallas Cockpit. Dallas Cockpit on 153 Main Street. In other words, this was where they had cockfights. In 1900, January 1st, 1900, cockfights were completely legal in Dallas and very, very popular at the time. Now, I'm looking at the news articles here, and the news articles uh, really surprised me because the news articles, almost every single one of them, deals with the main war that was going on on that day, and that, of course, was the Boer War in South Africa. Now, why in the world would Texans be interested in the Boer War, and yet that's all you will find here? Well, it turns out the Boer War, of course, was over gold, and the United States in 1900 was on the gold standard, as was England. And where was all the gold? It was primarily in South Africa. And so this had the great financial implications to the United States. And uh, I, I read with great surprise, there's a little article here It says, see if you can figure this out, okay? Here's what it says. It says officials uh, refuse to disclose the contents of Baden-Powell's dispatches his uh, unit has been attacked, and uh, his garrison has been attacked with 108 men killed, and severely wounded was Lord Edward Cecil. Now, the name Cecil, if you know anything about English history, of course, Lord, the original Lord Cecil was the uh, main advisor to Queen Elizabeth I, and the Cecils have been hugely important in English history. Well, Lord Cecil was with Baden-Powell, and <laughs> the article says they don't know if they survived or not. They just know that his garrison had lost 109. And uh, 
of course, we know that Baden Powell survived because what did Baden Powell go on to do in a few years after this? Yes. Uh, Boy Scouts. That's right. He created the Boy Scouts, the Boy Scouts in England, and then of course there was the American uh, version of the Boy Scouts. So uh, obviously, Baden Powell survived. Now it says here in a big box it says Germany all wrought up, and it, I realized very early on that this is a proxy war for what eventually becomes World War I. The, the, the English and on, on one side, the German. The German, of course, were big supporters of the Boers, who are Dutch settlers in South Africa. But the, the Germans wanted the gold. And of course, England wanted the gold. England won the World War and kept the gold. <laughs> they were able to stay on the gold standard. Now this means, you know, like to us it means nothing. We have what, bitcoins? Which, you know, where is the value? <laughs> floating, floating around somewhere <laughs> out there in cyberspace. By the way, do you know what the, where, where the word cyber comes from? Anybody ever heard the word cyber? Is it cyber? It's a, a, one of these words that are in the dictionary has been totally made up out of thin air. And uh, there's, there are quite a few of those. <laughs> that are that, you know words that sound very important but actually you know have no literal meaning. Anyway, uh, I have this here in case any of you want to look at this afterwards. But but it has got me thinking about Dallas. Dallas was already an important, a, a, a substantially important place uh, by 1900, and I'm going to try to explain to you. Uh, why I think this is. First of all, let's go back to the very early days of the Texas Republic. The Texas Republic, of course, was centered down in Austin, San Antonio, Houston area, uh, but it was not, there was hardly anybody that lived in what we call today North Texas. Now, North Texas was a um, just vast tracts of land primarily filled up with Indians. And the Indians were, and the native people, were being pushed uh, little by little farther and farther west. So in, during this time, uh, Sam Houston, who was then president of the Republic of Texas at the time he did this, he came <coughs> pretty much alone with one or two other people that came along with him. He rode by horseback from Washington on the Brasses up to uh, what is today Capel, the place called Grapevine Springs. And there he waited for the Indians to come because he had in his pocket a treaty called the Bird's Fork Treaty. And the Bird's Fork Treaty basically said this, land west of a line from Bird's Fork through Arlington and everything west belonged to the Indians, right? and that uh, the Birds Ford Treaty was to be signed by all these tribes. The Birds Ford Treaty was eventually signed, but not by Houston. Houston had to go back. He waited and waited for the Indians to show up, and they never came. Mm -hmm. And he was kind of like Teddy Roosevelt. He loved to camp out. And he loved, so he, he enjoyed coming, but eventually had to get back to the business of running Texas. It gives you an idea of how simple the Republic of Texas operation was in those days. Well, anyway, the Republic of Texas had, had entered into agreement with, with a, a group headed by a man named Peters. Have any of you ever heard of the Peters Colony? Well, the Peters Colony was, was out of Cincinnati. And Peters was this real estate guy who had this idea that he could bring a lot of people to Texas. And the, the Republic of Texas was interested in bringing more people, particularly in North Texas. So this is one of the great land grants of all time. It's called the Peters Colony, basically from more or less Dallas all the way west to Wichita Falls. It just took an enormous amount of land. And uh, there were four different contracts that they signed with Peters, as long as Peters kept get bringing people in. I mean, that was the whole point. Now, Peters, just by the way, uh, never came to Texas, and uh, he had a, he, he was in real estate, he always had a, a music store in Cincinnati, and the guy, this is really a strange story, 
the guy that um, uh, taught piano in his music store was named Stephen Foster. Mm -hmm. And uh, Stephen Foster and Peter got along very well. And so one day, uh, Stephen Foster came in and said, I've written a song and I want to give it to you. Now, in those days, there wasn't copyright or anything, so it, and this isn't quite as big a deal and, uh, as we might think. And actually, Stephen Foster gave this away to a number of people. But anyway, because of Peter's importance in Texas, I should mention to you that the, the song that Stephen Foster wrote and gave to Peter's was, goes like this. Oh, I come from Alabama with my banjo on my knee. I'm going to Louisiana, my true love for to see. Oh, Susanna, oh, don't you cry for me. I come from Alabama with a banjo on my knee. Now, that is one of the most famous, quote-unquote, folk songs in American history. And yet, it's not a folk song at all. It was just written by Stephen Foster to sound like a folk song. But, uh, but Peter's did you know have it rights to publish it but so did a lot of other people so it, it was uh this very peter's uh, P P peter's son eventually did come and settle in this area but the reason we want to mention peter's is because uh, when john neely bryant came in 1841 he was he was settling on peter's colony land and uh so he settled on the trinity to build a trading post and the reason that exact spot is because the Trinity is as you probably know kind of a muddy mess that doesn't have much water except you know when it's flood stage and it was hard to cross it but there was a spot basically under the Commerce Street Bridge if you know anything about downtown Dallas uh, coming from Oak Cliff where you have the Austin chalk you know uh, the escarpment out there is almost all limestone. That's why they have these concrete companies that, uh, cement companies, I mean, that built their, their factories. And so uh, this, this is, yeah, Portland cement. And this is why they could cross uh, in rather shallow water and it would be hard, hard pan, and then they could cross. And so two Indian traces crossed in this spot where John Neely Bryan put his his um, his little trading post. By the way, they've re they've reconstructed and re-engineered the Trinity River to the point that it's nowhere near it was. The, by the way, the Trinity River went right in what just around the Triple Underpass, mm -hmm. and uh, right about where Kennedy made the turn to go over to receive his uh, immortality. Uh, just at that spot is about where the steamboats came. Wow. And this, there were steamboats that made it up to Trinity, usually only in the spring when it was lots of water, and they had to really fight their way up. But they had, the Republic of Texas had chartered 25 cities up to Trinity. And uh, just uh, Dallas is about as far as you could go on the Trinity, and even that was a stretch, right? Well, anyway, <coughs> Peters comes and he, he, he uh, puts Dallas on the map in the sense that he's going to uh, have this little community, which he calls Dallas, and to this day people argue, you know, who was Dallas? They're pretty sure who Dallas County is named after, but not sure who Dallas, the city of Dallas is named after. Anyway, uh, John Neely Bryant, uh, Bryant was, a, was a man who, uh, you know, just an opportunist, wanted to sell lots. He wasn't having much success. 18, came 1841. By 1843 and 1849, he's on the way to California. Right, he's in. He, he he becomes part of the gold rush, and uh, so he is. Um, he leaves, and uh, other people come in and buy up Dallas. Now, this is where the story gets pretty interesting. Um, when uh, uh, General Tarrant and General Terrell came, uh, they came to a place which is actually in Arlington today called. Marrowbone Springs, 
And the marrow bone, by the way, is what the Indians made pipes out of, you know, because it was a stone that was easily carved. The marrow bone springs is still there if you want to go and find it. Well, anyway, um, they, the, the, the thing was that uh, they were, as soon as that Bird's Fork Treaty is settled, the Indians uh, were pushed back almost immediately. None of those treaties ever held. One of the greatest massacres of Indians was done by Tarrant and Terrell on Village Creek. Village Creek is, of course, a creek that runs through Arlington, and uh, just just a terrible uh, holocaust, you might say, uh, from from Texas having you know a huge population of indigenous people to having virtually none. Uh, they, they, they were so effective in pushing them out into uh, Oklahoma. And, um, oh, by the way, something that I saw in here when I was reading that day on January 1st, it kept referring to say, there would be a dateline, it would say some town, and then it would say IT. IT, 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 and I thought about that. Where is IT? I could not figure it out for a long time. Then finally hit me what IT stands for. Want to take a guess? Indian, Indian Territory. We See, this is long before Oklahoma exists, see. The thing you've got to remember is that uh, before, you know, the Sooners came and they settled Oklahoma, there really was Indian Territory. But even up there, the Indians got pushed around. And, uh, you know, many tragic stories. Now, so basically what you have is just another frontier town in the years leading up to the Civil War. However, there was a very, very important event that happened in 1855. And I'm going to argue that in Dallas's history, this is one of the watershed moments. And that is because of a group of Frenchmen who landed in Galveston and had bought, or thought they had bought, one million acres in what is today Dallas, up on the escarpment. Uh, these Frenchmen were from a group known as the Phalanxers. Now, let me explain a minute about Phalanx. So, in France, in 1848, there was a revolution. And the, part of this revolution, the revolutionaries, uh, were what we would think of today as very liberal, um, kind of communistic with a small c people who, who, who uh, wanted to escape France because they were being persecuted there politically and they wanted to come to the New World. So there were a number of these phalanx units that settled all over the United States. The one had bought land in what is north, basically Dallas County, uh, in, in in Oak Cliff, and they they came and walked. If you can imagine this, they walked from Galveston to Dallas. They walked in wooden shoes, and they went through. They had to carve new wooden shoes all along the way because they. I mean, this is a long walk, right? They started out down there. They started out down there in March. And they walked, and they and they came through uh, southern Texas in March, and then getting up in northern Texas in April. And the wildflowers were particularly great that year, right? The blue bonnets were just incredible, Indian paintbrush, all of it. And so they were so excited, uh, and rode home. They said, "This is paradise. This is absolutely the most beautiful place in the world," you know. You all come over here. So then they they finally arrived at the beginning of summer in Dallas, and uh, they <coughs> they found that the land they had they had purchased was all this limestone. Right? These people wanted to grow grapes, and uh, they did not have much success. So to, in order to survive, they had to go down to the Trinity River which in those days was not polluted and full of fish, and they took their fish traps down there. And, and to this day, you go over by Pinkston High School, the street that goes by there is called Fish Trap 
Road. Right. Mm -hmm. And Fish Trap Road is the one, they, they'd come from the escarpment, they lived up on, up on the hill in Oak Cliff, they'd come down, walk down, get their fish traps every night, get their fish, and then come back again. That's how they survived. And they did grow a few things, but most of them weren't farmers. And they didn't understand Texas climate, right? I mean, you got to get it in early, and you got to get it out early. And uh, they didn't really understand that concept. And so they had a hard, hard time. Uh, but they were, they were very intellectual, very cultural people. Many of them uh, artists, musicians of all kinds, writers. And uh, they uh, eventually, what ended it was when the Texas went into the Confederacy, the Confederate recruiters came around and said, you all have to join the Confederate Army. And they said, we're pacifists. You know, we don't believe in the war. And so they, th that caused the whole thing to break up. And it was, it was, it, it was this event that is important in the history of Dallas because where did they go? They moved, they moved across the street, uh, across the river into Dallas and they became the leading citizens of Dallas. Now Dallas has had this reputation from the very earliest days of being a city of culture, right? Uh, our friend uh, Eamon Carter made the famous statement, you go to Dallas for culture, you come to Fort Worth for fun. And that that's, was a divide that exists even today. I want you to think about this a minute. How many cities in the United States own and operate a classical music station? Th try to think of one. The only one you can think of is Dallas, Texas. WRR, owned by the city of Dallas since 1922. In fact, WRR is the second oldest station still on the air in America. The first one is in Pittsburgh, uh, KKDA. And it's been operating, uh, you know, for a long time. Uh, by the way, you know, nowadays, if you're a K, you're in the western part of the United States, and if you're a W, you're in the eastern part. But that didn't apply back in 1922, so we have a W, and Pittsburgh had a K, right? But it, Anyway, WRR still to this day owned by the city of Dallas, still and still plays classical music. Now you might ask why? Well, the answer is because Dallas had this cultural um, foundation that these uh, phalanxers um, were very intent on. And by the way, the leader of the phalanxers in France was a man named Fourier. Now Fourier sent groups various places in the United States, and one group he sent to Wisconsin. Now, you talk about ironic. This is the most ironic event in American political history. Let me tell you why. The phalanxers came about the same time, a little bit earlier, and they set up their Wisconsin phalanx. Remember, this is the Dallas phalanx, which, by the way, is called what? La Reunion. La Reunion. La Reunion Phalanx. Well, the one in Wisconsin is called the Wisconsin Phalanx. And they were very unhappy in that time uh, in the 1850s because they were not only pacifists, but they were egalitarians. And they couldn't believe that neither political party was doing anything about slavery. That's, that's horrible from their point of view, this horrible institution. And so it was in the Wisconsin phalanx, the town was called Ripon, Wisconsin, where the phalanxers called a meeting. The, the man who called the meeting was named Alan Beauvais. He's Frenchman, of course. And he invited his phalanxer friends to come, and uh, also people from the community. And he, he got up and he said, we believe that neither political party is dealing with the question of slavery. And neither party has advocated um, abolition. By the way, the parties were the Democratic Party and then, of course, the Whigs. And um, so, Alan Beauvais said, 
We need to start a political party that the foundation plank is going to be ending slavery. Republican. So, what shall we call it, Alan Bovey? He said, well, you know, we all have spent our lives uh, defending the French Republic, right? And this is what caused us to kick, got kicked out of France. And he said, so naturally, we believe in the Republic, so let's call it the Republican Party. Now, and again, in one of history's great ironies, the Republican Party is founded primarily by a group of French communists. <laughs> you know, this, this, this is not a popular story at, at the Republican Convention. <laughs> but that's exactly what happened. You can, if you go to Ripon, Wisconsin today, they have a, a building there called the Little White Schoolhouse. And there's a historical sign that said, here in 1854, the Republican Party was founded. And then that group, you know, banded together with some other groups and eventually had a, um, a presidential candidate. The very first one was, anybody know? Abraham Lincoln. No, he was nope. number two. And their first one was a man named Fremont, a California senator. And he was a very, and then, and then it was, of course, in the 1860 uh, election uh, that they nominated Abraham Lincoln. And, uh, and he was a compromise candidate because <coughs> some people thought that the this Republican Party was too radical, and so they uh, changed. Anyway, uh, one one of the thesis points then tonight is this idea that the the Dallas starts out very high-minded. You know, this is a, a place that has these people that have these. I so it wasn't very long before Dallas had a. Opera House and Dallas had Symphony and all the other things that would you wouldn't expect on the, in the, on the frontier. Now, <coughs> one, one thing that it's interesting in Texas and in, in Dallas County in particular, they voted about being in Confederacy. You know, no, none of the other states did that, did it that way. But in Texas, they voted, and Texas, uh, particularly East Texas, was cotton. And the cotton was already becoming very big, and so these plantation had been established for a number of years, and so it's not surprising that Dallas uh, was a Confederate stronghold, as you might guess. But it's also surprising that after the Civil War is over, many of these ex-Confederate soldiers had nothing to go home to. So they came from Alabama, and they came from Mississippi and Georgia, and they moved to Texas because they could get free land here. And they started over here. This is why uh, the Klan was so huge in Dallas. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But what I want to talk about is the fact that from the very beginning, Dallas has had these promoters. I can't think of the only word that really is better than as boosters. They had these boosters, people that were going to make sure Dallas was had its place in the sun. And one of the most brilliant pieces of legislation they were able to get through is this idea that <coughs> the East-West Railroad and the North-South Railroads had to had to come within one mile of Browder Springs. Does anybody know where Browder Springs is? We call it today Old City Park. It was the very, Browder Springs was the very first Dallas water supply was from Browder Springs. And so it was, it was, it was then that uh, in 1872, the uh, Houston and Texas Central came up from Houston and then in 1873, the Texas and Pacific, they essentially crossed in Dallas. Now that guaranteed Dallas was going to be an important place. But you know how they pulled that little thing off is amazing. You know, for many years, uh, Denison was a much bigger railroad center than Dallas ever was, and yet Dallas was the crossroads. And of course, you know, one thing leads to another. Eventually, then all the highways come through here. 
and then all of the interstates come here, and uh, then uh, ultimately they build the great DFW International Airport, which of course is, uh, again, one of these things uh, that's, that I, I won't get to speak much about tonight, but it's the, the rivalry and hatred that Fort Worth and Dallas have had for each other. And uh, Fort Worth built this great international airport yeah. in 1950 something yeah. uh, called uh, Great Southwest. And uh, they yeah, built this the airport just on the Tarrant County side of the line. And, uh, and they had, you know, uh, American Airlines was there, Braniff was there, they were all these big airlines were there. But nobody came from Dallas. Dallas would not come. And so the thing eventually just died. You know, it's one of the great white elephants. In, and I remember taking off from DFW in the early years and they'd see this big runway, empty runways. And I asked somebody, what is all that? Oh, that's Great Southwest. And uh, all, you know, all gone now. But anyway, <coughs> so the railroads came here. This is where it gets really important. Because the railroads are here, then industry comes. Now think of this. At one time, Dallas was the world center. The world center of cotton, of leather. And by the way, when we think of leather, you, you think cows. But, but you also need to think of buffalo hides. There were lots and lots of buffalo still in Texas in, in the early 1860s and 70s. Saddle making, number one. Do we think of Fort Worth, you know, saddle, leather, all that? And then, of course, it became huge in cotton gin manufacturing. Yep. And, and then cotton seed oil, uh, Colgate, Palm Olive built a huge plant, which is still there in South Dallas, just so they could make toothpaste, you know, the, the basis of which was cotton seed. Well, anyway, I want to talk to you then about this period that starts in, in uh, about around 1900. Now, 1900 is a crucial time in Dallas because just about 1900, really important things start to happen in Dallas. The, the railroads were here. Um, in fact, by 1911, there are 80 trains a day in and out of Dallas and nine major railroads. There are a lot of little short lines, but nine major railroads. And uh, that's when they built Union Station. Uh, Union Station was the DFW of its time. And Union Station was one of the busiest uh, railroad uh, stations in America for a long time. Anyway, in 1901, uh, Dallas gets a Carnegie Library. Now, one of the great tragedies is that they eventually tore down that beautiful building, uh, Carnegie Library. Uh, it would be such a prize now to have, a historic building. But so many of these little towns around Texas did not tear down their Carnegie Libraries, and they still had it. Now, but again, it's, it, Carnegie um, was just coming into money at that time. He, this is about the time he built his southern... Uh, Birmingham, Alabama, U.S. Steel operation. And uh, so uh, Dallas got a Carnegie Library very early. Again, speaks to emphasis on culture. Then in 1903, um, the pastor of First Baptist Church gets up and, and gives a sermon, and the gist of it is this. Dallas deserves a great humanitarian hospital. Dallas didn't have any, in uh, uh, 1903, Dallas didn't have a good hospital. He said, Dallas deserves a hospital and we're going to build it, True. meaning the, the Baptist. And, uh, and we're going to name it after our greatest Baptist hero in Texas history, and that, of course, is Robert Baylor. Now, I'll just pause on Baylor for a minute. Baylor was in the War of 1812, if you can imagine. And he's one of these guys that kept moving west. He was in Alabama, and he's in um, Kentucky. He was in the state pledge. It's a very similar story to Sam Houston's story, or for that matter, John Neely Bryan. 
These guys all came from kind of the middle south, and they all eventually end up, you know, that's where Crockett came from, and, and uh, Bowie and Travis, and all these guys, you know, they, they're all coming to what they consider paradise here, because Texas, at least up to about Dallas, has enough rain to grow crops, particularly cotton, but you don't have to cut down a forest to, you know, to create it. And so this great prairie and rangeland, and which is, of course, the foundation of Texas fortune, particularly with the, in the cattle industry. Well, anyway, uh, Baylor says, we're going to build it. And so, uh, excuse me, uh, um, George Stewart said, we're going to build it. By the way, this is an interesting aside. How many churches, when they have their 100th anniversary, have only had two pastors? Yeah. <laughs> Think about that a minute. Oh, wow. The first Baptist Dallas had George Druitt, right. and then he was there 50 years, and then, of course, W.A. Criswell, who had to be there 51 years, so he'd be longer than yeah. Druitt. Oh, so if you go down to Baylor, by the way, Baylor, even today, is as big as Parkland. Uh, in terms of the size of the thing. Uh, Baylor University, uh, Baylor Hospice, actually not uh, uh, Baylor <coughs> University connected anymore. Baylor Hospital, um, the first building they built down there was George Truitt Hospital. And you can still, you know, people still stay and are taking Genius. care of it. Yeah. yeah, George Truitt is, 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 is really important. And, you know, these things are so relative, but for his time, he was, he was very progressive and very, uh, very uh, different than uh, <laughs> the other crazy man that was from Dallas named J. Frank Norris, who, who was uh, the eternal enemy of uh, George Truett. And uh, perhaps I'll be able to tell you a story about his story one of these days. Anyway, uh, then in 1911, another miraculous thing happened. It was this. So the Methodist Episcopal Church South. Now you remember, we think of Methodist, you know, as a denomination, but the Methodist came out of the Episcopal. In other words, Church of England. And so they always called themselves Methodist Episcopal Church, M-E-C. And then the Civil War caused the split, and so then it became South. And their headquarters was in Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, they were, and there they had their great institution of learning called Vanderbilt. Well, Vanderbilt, of course, got all the Vanderbilt money, hence the name, and they didn't need the Methodist Church anymore, so they basically cut ties. And the Methodists had to find a new place to headquarter out of and, and build a great university and a great seminary. Now, of all the places to choose in the United States, or at least in the southern part of the United States, you wouldn't think in 1911 that Dallas would be the place. But through a long string of coincidences, chance, uh, Southern Methodist University was created, and it would be the center of the Methodist Episcopal Church South. And uh, so, of course, you know, that was a tremendous shot of an arm in the arm to have a major university in this little place called Dallas. You know, when they built Southern Methodist, way out in the boonies, right? And uh, <coughs> it was, uh, <coughs> nobody dreamed that it would, you know, that they'd never have, eventually not have enough land, right? <coughs> SMU's had to tear down I don't know how many buildings, you know, to keep growing. Then there was another one of these extraordinary events in 1912 that is so impossible and probable, even telling me, I'll tell you the story, but you won't believe it. So these boosters in Dallas thought, you know, Dallas is getting big now. Dallas is important. We need to have a great world-class five-star hotel and they said, so they had a little committee, and they said, who That's in the foolish. world is going to pay for and build a, a hotel in Dallas? I mean, Dallas, again, this is 1912, 
there's hardly anything, you know, consequence going on in Dallas in 1912. And so they talk about it, and they somebody mentioned Adolphus Bush, because he had he had some real estate holdings in Dallas. He had made a fortune selling beer uh, to Texans, and because remember there were a lot of Germans that lived in Texas. This is one of the great surprises of Texas, how many Germans came and lived here. And he sold a lot of beer here. We know it as, of course, Budweiser. And uh, so they thought, well, he, you know, he's made a lot of money here, and uh, he, he, he might support building a great hotel here. So they got on the train, this little committee, and they went up and arranged a meeting with Adolphus Bush. And Adolphus Bush knew Dallas very well. And they said, we want you to build a great world-class hotel in downtown Dallas. And he said, well, gentlemen, I, I might be interested in doing that, but I have two big, actually three conditions. What are these conditions? Well, the first thing is you've got to build it in only one place. Where's that? At the corner of Commerce and Boy, my line's just going blank now. Uh, across the street there, Hector. next to the Magnolia. Irving. Huh? Irby. Irby, thank you. Irby. At the corner, the northwest corner of Commerce and Irby. Well, sir, sir, um, that's where City Hall is. <laughs> well, I know, but if you want the hotel, you got to build it there. <laughs> well, okay, we'll, we'll consider that. So what's the second condition? got to be 22 stories. Okay, but why 22? He said, well, there were 22 of us kids. And in case we happen to have a family reunion, I want each family to have its own floor. So they, ch they chuckled at that, but said, and you said there's something else. Oh yeah, it was one more thing. I want you to put a huge very beautiful decorated German Stein on top of the building. <laughs> well, well, we'll see if we can do any of this, sir. So they go back and they said, you know, it'd be worth to tear down City Hall. <laughs> and uh, as far as beer stein, we don't care what it looks like. So if you go down to Commerce Street today and look up on the right hand side is the flying red horse, and just to the left of the flying red horse on the top of the Adolphus is a huge beer stein on the 22nd floor. <laughs> so that's, again, luck, chance, personalities, people. So Dallas got a world class in 1912. Then in 1913, of all people, of all people, Henry Ford comes to Dallas's salvation. Henry Ford realizes that it's too expensive to build Model T's in Detroit and ship them uh -huh. to Dallas. Very expensive. Much cheaper to build in Texas to build a plant. So, of course, they all go up and pitch to Henry Ford, all these towns. But he chooses Dallas. Why? Well, because Dallas is an up-and-coming city, progressive city. And Dallas is um, a city that uh, he thought might have a future. So he builds the Ford plant in what we call today Deep Ellum. Yep. And uh, it was there for many years. They, they built thousands of Model Ts there and into the 20s. And then eventually they move out to East Grand and build a new plant out there. But th that uh, company called Adams Hat takes over that property, and, and Adam Sad, of course, uh, was, was there until some recently, and now it's become, of course, what they call it, um, lofts and condos and that yeah. kind of thing. But th if you go north on 75, you'll notice the highway swings right around that building, Adam Sad building, because that's an original Henry Ford Model T factory. Astounding, right? And so it's still there, and it looks just exactly like it would. Also, about this time, <coughs> there was a man in Dallas that brought great 
kind of fame to Dallas. In, 19, in 1912, uh, there was a preacher at the corner of uh, Harwood, uh, Harwood and Bryant, downtown Dallas. It was in a little church, a little Congregationalist church. Congregationalist, what the Puritans eventually called themselves. And this this preacher was a it was kind of um, a, a bigger than life kind of personality. Anyway. He had this idea for a new kind of Bible, all right? Now this new kind of Bible, what he, what we call today a study Bible, would, would have, uh, down the middle, would have commentary ex explaining what the, what the Bible was saying, right? In other words, interpreting the Bible. So he was preaching uh, around the country and occasionally would go into England and preach. And uh, he went, so he asked somebody, he said, what is the biggest publishing company in England? And they said, well, Oxford University Press, of course, and uh, the official publisher of the King James Bible. And he said, I think I'll go talk to them. So he walks in, this obscure preacher with no credentials, from this little teeny church in Dallas, Texas, walks in and says, Hello, uh, sir. My name is W. Is C. W. No, C. C. I. Schofield. Thank you. Schofield. No. Schofield. And they said, "Yeah, well, what do you want?" And he said, well, "I've got this new kind of Bible called a study Bible, and um, I think I think you should print it." So they they kind of mulled over the idea and they thought well you know this is something new something different we'll try to publish it so they published it it became except for the bible it became their biggest published publication of all time it's still in print today over a hundred years later the schofield study bible when i first time i heard uh criswell w.a criswell preached down at first baptist church I remember, you know, waiting, waiting, waiting. Finally, he got up, and I was going to hear the great man. I mean, I knew nothing. When I came to Dallas in 1970, I knew nothing about Dallas except one thing. I knew the First Baptist Church was the home church of Billy Graham. Yeah. That impressed me. So I thought, if this guy is the preacher, he must be good. So he gets up, and this is exactly what he said. And oh. Uh, reading from my beloved Schofield Bible. I said, Schofield Bible? I mean, what's a, what's a Schofield Bible? And then he read, and, and of course, eventually I find out that he's a great follower of Schofield, W.A. Criswell. And uh, so, so uh, Schofield, now th this, this is astonishing to me. But this was such a big hit that all over the world, there, the, the Schofield Bible. There was a great famous evangelist in Chicago named Dwight L. Moody. Moody. Moody Bible Institute. His whole, his whole correspondence course was based on the Schofield Bible. And uh, so Schofield, of course, became very famous. He spent about 20, almost 30 years here in Dallas. And he decided to build a Bible college. So he built a Bible college, very small, and uh, he uh, hired a man to take care of it. And eventually, when Schofield died, that man renamed it and named it Dallas, Dallas Theological, Theological Seminary, Seminary, which of course became this kind of a buckle of the Bible built uh, place, you know, really hardcore fundamentalist uh, study at. Uh, Dallas Theological Seminary. So Schofield, one more thing about Schofield. So Schofield, this is unbelievable. Schofield was in <coughs> preaching in Belfast, Northern Ireland on April 14th, 1912. Does anybody in this room know what happened that was connected with Belfast, Northern Ireland, on April 14th, 
Titanic. You made that Titanic. Yes, the Titanic. Yeah, the Titanic went down. And, uh, and so the Titanic went, was hit on the 14th and sunk on the 15th. By the way, what other important historical event happened on April 14th and 15th? A, 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 I'll give you the year, 1865. That was the, that was the year that, and the time that Abraham Lincoln was assassinated on the 14th and died on the 15th. Just like the Titanic. So anyway, uh, so they, so many died, you know, they had built the Titanic in, in uh, Belfast, All, half the crew were from Belfast, and uh, so they decided they couldn't have individual funerals, they just had one big funeral. Now just take a big, fat, huge, colossal guess of all the preachers in England, you know, you've got the, the Archbishop of Canterbury got all these famous preachers, who would they ask to do the funeral eulogy for the Titanic? C.I. Schofield. Oh, oh my goodness. Yeah. By the way, he was so famous when uh, Oxford University Press came out with the 300th uh, year edition of the King James Bible, they asked Schofield to be the general editor. What a, you know, what an honor. This obscure preacher from Dallas, Texas, brought fame, you see, to Dallas by, you know, just indirectly. Then another amazing thing happens. The Federal Reserve is created in 1914, and they're going to build these regional uh, Federal Reserves. And, of course, astonishing, all the towns in Texas wanted to have Federal Reserve, right, as did New Orleans and all this regional area. In fact, everybody thought it was going to go to New Orleans. And uh, Houston wanted it, San Antonio wanted it, Austin wanted it, and then little old Dallas wanted it. Guess who got it? <laughs> Dallas. See? So down there, just uh, two blocks from the Adolphus, is the, exactly, the Federal Reserve. And that brought that brought a lot of money to Dallas, and then Dallas eventually became the center of the um, of the oil industry financing. The Dallas was never a big oil town like Houston, but it was a big insurance and banking town, and all of which was eventually wiped out in the in the early 70s. But it was very very important. Um, the Dallas also had was the center for freemen. There were three freemen's towns in Dallas, the most famous of which we call Deep Ellum. And <clears throat> one of the most important groups uh, in the African-American community in Dallas were called the Knights of Pythias. Mm -hmm. Now, this is, this is another coincidence that's amazing. The Knights of Pythias, by the way, the building's still there. Yeah. We call it Union Banker, uh, the big sign, Union Bank, right oh. near the Ford plant. <coughs> the designer of that building was the son-in-law of Booker T. Washington. <coughs> and so Booker T. Washington had only one daughter. And of course, those, uh, those children, Booker T. and his wife wanted to, so they came from Tuskegee Institute. By the way, I started my career teaching in a freedom school out of Tuskegee Institute. And uh, in 1965, so uh, I have great love and appreciation for Tuskegee. Anyway, Booker T. Washington, who was the president of Tuskegee, would come often to Dallas, and you know where where he would speak. They had <laughs> racism and segregation were so strong back then that in the in the early years of the 20th century, they had um, uh, they had a day. They called it Negro Day, in which African Americans, that's the day they went to the fair. Nobody else went, right. just the African American community went. And they, and of course, when I first came to Texas, the thing that really knocked me over was how important Juneteenth was. Juneteenth was a huge deal down in Fair Park. And it's as, as sad to say, that's kind of, you know, abated over the years. But I always thought Juneteenth was just a great idea, because there needed to be some way to celebrate the end of slavery. I'm a director of the uh, uh, NEH Institute on Slavery at the Library of Congress this summer. And uh, this is one of the things we'll talk about. 
you know, is how these cultural things get watered down over time. And it's a, it's a great shame. Uh, the historically um, black uh, African American colleges, so many of them, were extraordinary institutions. And then once integration came along, a school like, say, Fisk, where it were nothing compared to what it had been before, because again, all the money and all the all the, 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 the students went over to Vanderbilt where they could get in. But anyway, uh, so to contrast this, they also had, are you ready for this? They had Clan Day at the fair. Yeah. So Clan Day was, was the day, every, the only people there were Clan. And they, you know how big Fair Park is. They filled up that thing. Well, anyway, <laughs> in 1923, they, this is, this is astonishing. They, at, at, at Fair Park, they had Clan Day and they wanted to have a speaker who would be, you know, prestige and somebody important. So they invited Philip Sanger to give the keynote address during Clan Day. You know, the very Philip Sanger is on, right here, on this app. And Philip Sanger, the, what's the irony of this? Philip Sanger is a Jew. Yeah. And the clan, they, they hated the Jews, they hated the Roman Catholics, they hated anybody who wasn't white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, right? So it never occurred to Wasp, yes, they, it never occurred to him that Philip Sanger was not a Wasp, see? And so he came, he gave the speech, they all applauded, and, and he went back, you know, down to the department store and uh, continued doing business with members of the Klan. Uh, Dallas was run by a group called the Dallas Citizens Committee for years and years and years. And they, so many of those members, you know, were, were, were Klan members. Uh, by the way, uh, the head of the Klan at that time, in 1923, was a man named Hiram Wesley Evans, who was a cut-rate dentist in Dallas. And he, he was the imperial wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. The Klan had died out. Remember, the Klan had started after the Civil War, 1865, started supposedly by a man named Bedford Forrest, a general, a Confederate general. And Bedford Forrest was lionized in Dallas. They loved him, and they named an avenue after him. Forrest Avenue. Right? It was right down into Fair Park. Just take a big fat guess what Forest Avenue is called today. Martin Luther King. King. Martin Luther King <laughs> Jr. <laughs> Avenue. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the poor head of the Klan got, got, got uh, his come up and saw that one. Uh, by the way, I was mentioning the Adolphus. One thing I wanted to mention about the Adolphus, in 1917, a group of men got together in the Adolphus in the French room there and uh, organized a new service organization. You know what it was called? The Lions Club. The Lions Club started in 1917 in the Adolphus Hotel. I mentioned before about WRR, and, and this, again, the, the thing that's important to remember is Dallas is kind of on the cutting edge of technology. I mean, this little town in the middle of Texas has has the second oldest radio station is owned by the city. 1935, Ma Ferguson defeated the Klan candidate, and that was one of the one of the great victories. And uh, the Klan by then was wiped out. The original Klan, by the way, died out pretty quickly, but it was reborn by a movie of all things called The Birth of the Nation. Oh yes. W. A. Griffin. And uh, this movie was, is, if you've ever, a silent movie, but it's just the most racist, horribly uh, awful movie. And it ginned up all this interest in, in uh, the Klan again. So they went out to Stone Mountain, uh, which was, of course, a kind of Confederate shrine. By the way, uh, you know the guy that built Mount Rushmore? He was hired by the Daughters of the Confederacy to build a Mount Rushmore on Stone Mountain. And he started in doing it. The, the three that were up there were gonna be Lee and Jeb Stewart 
and Stonewall Jackson. Yeah. By the way, the very three that were when were sent in by the army to get um, John Brown at Harper's Ferry, 1859, right? And so Gutzon Borglum, uh, this more Danish Mormon guy, Gutzon Borglum uh, got crossways with the Daughters Confederacy. So one day he took his he took all his um, dynamite out there and blew and blew it right off the face of Stone Mountain. <laughs> if you if you go to there today, they have a little replica of it. You know, you, it's like a postage stamp on that thing, right? But Gutzon Borglum you know, was building this big thing. So then he went up to South Dakota where he was invited to build this great monument to the presidents of four American eras, uh, of these four periods of American history, Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, and Roosevelt, uh, Teddy Roosevelt. And of course, we call it Mount Rushmore. And it's one of the most famous icons of America. But uh, it would have never been built if uh, Guts and Borglum had gotten along with the Daughters of the Confederacy. Uh, how are we doing on time, Tom? Uh, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. You're so good, I, haven't, I lost track of time. Keep going. Yeah. Yeah. We don't yeah. even up to date yet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you like it. Well, well, no, no, here, no, no, yeah. Uh, I'd I, say you're near the end, but yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I get it. The hook. <laughs> the hook's here somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, I wanted to mention a couple of other things that I think are extraordinary. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a talk at uh, Highland Park, not Highland Park, um, Lakewood Public Library, first Wednesday in February, on what's called the Whoopi War. And the Whoopi War is this colossal warfare that blew up in the Depression in 1936. And it, it's, it's in a, another whole hour just on that. But I wanted to mention, in case any of you are free to come, uh, 1 o'clock at Lakewood Library, the first Wednesday in February, hear that talk because it's a really quite an extraordinary story. Because Dallas goes through these periods of, of, of growth, and one of them is this constant trying to outdo Fort Worth, and Fort Worth trying to outdo Dallas. You know, this has gone back and forth and back and forth. Um, uh, oh, in 1931, Highland Park Village was built, and that's is one of the very first uh, mall-type concepts, where, where all the buildings face toward each other and a little complex where you could just walk around. And that was, that was very, very cutting edge. And then, uh, of course, one other thing that needs to be mentioned that brought great prestige to Dallas, and that is that Frank Lloyd Wright only built, only designed in his entire career one theater, and that happened to be the Dallas Theater Center. And uh, Frank Lloyd Wright um, was as modern as his architecture was, he was very old fashioned technology, he didn't believe in elevators. So when he was 95 years old, he came to visit the site. They were almost done building it. And uh, they had built a huge elevator in the middle of the thing. So he, um, he when they came, they put up this uh, construction tape. You know, it said, danger, caution, do not go in. <laughs> and because uh, they didn't want him to see the elevator. And luckily, he didn't. He would have been livid. Because he liked, you know, he liked, but anyway, because of this, Dallas has the only uh, theater ever built by Frank Lloyd Wright. There are lots and lots. That's George Dahl. Well, George Dahl, of course, was the great designer of the, of the, of the uh, Centennial. Fair Most Park. of those buildings out at Fair Park come from the Centennial. And uh, George Dahl uh, was a great master of what we call Art Deco. Yeah. But uh, George Dahl is very underappreciated, very, very underappreciated. And most people in Dallas go out to, you know, they go to the state fair and have no idea what George Dahl meant to that. So, yeah, point well taken. Now, I guess we go into question and answer here yeah. or something? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. You get to stay there now. Okay. Yeah, answer questions. All of a sudden, the kids came in here toward the end. There it is. Tommy. 
you got one over here. During the uh, Prohibition days of the 1920s, yes. uh, there was a uh, psychiatric hospital down on Syene that uh, later became Tri-Cities Hospital. I don't recall what the name of that psychiatric hospital was, but I know a contractor who was down in the basement of that, and uh, one of the people from the building was telling him about the tunnel. The, that is part of the limestone area. There was a tunnel, apparently, that went quite a distance over to Butler Boulevard to a car dealership. Mm -hmm. And uh, what would happen is the uh, wealthy of uh, Dallas would have family members who had become addicted to various and sundry things. Mm -hmm. And uh, they'd be being treated at the psychiatric hospital. And uh, I was just wondering if you knew anything about the history of that. And, uh, and so I'd ask you to follow up on it because it's a very interesting thing about that tunnel. Yeah. The, uh, th that, that reminds me very much of the, the tunnels they built out at the top of the hill casino, uh, which is the same thing. They were trying, they're always trying to have a way to escape. And I, my guess is that tunnel had something to do with uh, people they wanted to bring in and out secretly. That'd be my, my, my only guess. By the way, something I wanted to mention, Tom, just as a tag along to my talk. And again, my, my underlying thesis is that people, particular individuals, have made a huge difference in Dallas. And one of those people that made such a big difference was in uh, the summer of 1954, this young man working at TI, he hadn't been there long enough down on Lemon to get summer vacation, so they put him on an assignment to try to connect our transistors. Yeah. And, uh, and so in a silicon chip, he lined up these, but he couldn't figure out how to connect it all up. And he remembered, he remembered that when he was a boy, the, the farmers in Kansas, when they would plow a field, they'd come to the end of the row and then they'd turn around and come. And they never, the plow never was lifted up. In other words, the plow was always in the ground. So that's what he did. He connected those those transistors in this back and forth pattern in a little silicon chip. And what he had invented was the microchip. And our entire modern technological world runs on microchips. It's all done by this guy in his spare in his um, non-vacation time by the name of Jack Kilby. And Jack Kilby, of course, finally got the Nobel Prize for doing that. This is another example of the importance of just certain individuals. Go ahead. So what was the story of the demise of the major Dallas-owned banks? And what happened? What? Why was that in the 70s? Yeah. I know about the savings and loan crash in the yeah. 80s, but That's really it. The savings and loan crash. You know, savings loans were huge. Uh, in Texas and uh, here in Dallas. And then when the crash came, because again, the balloon financing and all this stuff that seems to repeat itself throughout history, not only took down the savings and loans, but a lot of banks were uh, taken down at that time. The big ones, Mercantile Republic and so forth, they survived only to be merged with because they were so weakened by all this. And, uh, and so Dallas has never been thought of as a great um, uh, banking center since then. And, uh, but Dallas is amazingly adept at reinventing itself and uh, seems to find new ways in, uh, to, uh, to grow and prosper. And uh, you, you again, you ask yourself the question, why? Uh, all these corporations come and settle in, in Dallas. I mean, they could go to Austin, they could go to San Antonio, they come to Dallas. <laughs> Dallas has a kind of a New York City feel about it. it. You know, all these things are relative, but it's a much more of a go-go city than, say, San Antonio. I, I love San Antonio, everybody loves San Antonio, but it's very laid back. <laughs> and not Dallas, boy, wired up, big time. Yeah, next. 
Yeah, go ahead. Where's the thing over here? Uh, in the 70s, when the banks crashed, wasn't that heavily related to all the money that the banks had loaned to South America? And when they got the money down there, they turned around and said, track them and getting it? Yeah, that was part of it. And But, but also a, a part of it was they, they tried to leverage too much money. In other words, the, the, the real estate, yeah, they, they, they put out a mortgage. And only you know only required 10% down, even zero down. See? So there was no money. The whole thing was blue. so when when the property went belly up, the bank is holding the bag, and and, the, and they could sell the property. Of course, it was very very inefficient to do that, and expensive. So um, th and then this happened again in 2008. The very same thing. Because they could, they they could do these things, and they did them, and they we you know the economy just about tanked in 2008. Yes. Well, I was uh, wondering why you missed your uh, best opportunity there. You were talking about uh, was it Sanger who was speaking to the yes KKK? Philip Sanger. Well, those were his best customers. Yeah. All that white sheet. Oh, well, oh, that's, that's a great line. I had fun with that. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll use that. No, I, I was under the impression that Dallas came to prominence because of the oil money when they, you know, the spindle top boom in Terrell. Yeah. Dallas was the nearest big city, and so you had Neiman Marcus and everything yeah, else. Yeah, yeah. Well. It, oil has played a big role, but not nearly what oil played in Houston. Uh, but Dallas, you see, is always. There's always been a lot of money here, and therefore the big entrepreneurs here. And the, 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 thing, the thing just, it, it just keeps jenning up itself. It, what is it, 200 people move to Dallas every day? I mean, this is an astonishing number. But of course, people are moving out, of course, also. But, uh, but it's, uh, it's just growth feeds growth. And uh, I, I'm, you know, as puzzled over it as anybody. Uh, I've, I've always loved living in Dallas, and I've enjoyed it. But, but if you're objective about it, what what does Dallas have? Well, one thing it has is it has, um, it, it, although the weather isn't great here, it's a lot better than Chicago. Mm, yeah, I <laughs> see. Uh, Not South Wax. Yeah, and, and there's enough rain. See, you know that you know Cal California has this great climate, but but it has no water, and so it's one thing there's always been enough of in Texas is water, and that that's of course hugely important. Yeah, these are great questions. Who's who's next? Anybody? Yes, go ahead. You know, there's only one natural lake in Texas. Yes, Caddo, and it, it, and even in its present state, it's a reservoir, because they they had to raise it. This is hard to explain, but they had to raise the level of it to bring in the steamboats. There was a very important steamboat center on Caddo Lake called Swanson's Landing, and then from Swanson's Landing, they would come up all the way to Jefferson. Jefferson. And Jefferson, of course, if you've ever been to Jefferson, you know that it's a southern town stuck in, it's a Louisiana yeah. town stuck in Texas. Yeah. It's very, very southern because that's where the steamboats turned around. That's where they picked up the cotton. And there's a very, very different feel in, uh, say, uh, Natchitoches, Louisiana, which is the oldest French settlement in Louisiana and Dallas. This is very has a very western feel to it, uh, and even more so in Fort Worth. Fort Worth would like to claim to be, you know, where the West begins, uh, but I think historically speaking, it was Dallas. Yeah. What is the uh, story of Washington on the Brazos? Yeah. Well, why there? Uh, again, it was a, it was just a convenient halfway, you know, from the various population centers at that time. And I think they, uh, they it, it was well known community early, even though today there's nothing there. 
Yes, ma'am. Oh, you never mentioned the Degoyers. I guess they Oh, yeah. Them. Yeah, well, the Degoyers, uh, I didn't mention, bro. You know, there's so many that I could talk about that have been these entrepreneurs that have made all the difference in Dallas history, and Degoyer is one of them. And, of course, uh, Degoyer's gave a lot. The, and then the TI guys, you know, especially McDermott and University of Texas at Dallas. You know, all the money they poured into that place. Yes, sir. Uh, I've read a little bit about the history of Dallas, and I was wondering, do you have any information that would confirm uh, spurs I've heard that the Klan in Dallas in the 20s used to meet at First Baptist Church. Yeah, I've never uh, been able to confirm that. I've heard that rumor too, but I've never been able to confirm it. Uh, it wouldn't be terribly surprising, but you know, the Klan modeled itself after the, the, the Masonic Lodge, everything in secret, and they would, they would oftentimes meet in lodges because the members of the lodge, many of them were Klan members. And uh, there was a, just to give you an idea, in 1860, there was a terrible fire that burned down much of Dallas, 1860, just before the Civil War. And uh, so they, uh, they lynched uh, three slaves for starting the fire. And uh, that, there, wasn't any, there wasn't a bit of anybody question that at all, in, in other words. They had to have a scapegoat, and they had a scapegoat, you know, for the fire. Go ahead. Uh, regarding J. Frank Norris, I've heard stories that he was a Klan member, oh, yeah. and that's how he got off from that, from killing uh, uh, chips. Chip. Yeah, chips. that is absolutely correct. He was he whether he was an active Klan member, I'm not sure, but he was certainly very uh, um, patronizing of the Klan, and the Klan folks uh, in Fort Worth. Uh, were big supporters of his, and uh, but Norris was one of these people. Uh, reminds me of Wallace, governor of Alabama, right? Sure. How how he would modify his stance based on the political winds, you know, how they would change. But you're right about um, how how do you murder somebody in your church and get away with it? Yeah, most, jur most of the jurors were Klan members. Exactly. Yeah. And he, he, by the way, you know, the Klan fancied that there were great moralists. And they're going, you know, so they, so Norris spent so much of his time closing down Hell's Half Acre, closing down horse racing in, in Arlington, but never was able to close Top of the Hill Casino because Top of the Hill Casino uh, was very uh, well connected with the mafia and the clan, and and uh, top of the hill casino. We were talking earlier about tunnels. They had all these tunnels, so <clears throat> when the Texas Rangers would come and raid, they would all go into the tunnel and come out. And there were many murders out there at top of the hill. And uh, top of the hill, uh, the way they got rid of the bodies, there was a pig farm. So they dragged the bodies through the tunnel and thrown down to the pigs. And the next morning, you know, no body, nothing left. Yeah. But by the way, top of the hill eventually went bankrupt. And and then of all people who bought it, the very seminary that J. Frank Norris founded in Fort Worth, when they got over there, they changed the name to Do Arlington Baptist College, which is what it is today. That's where the casino was. That's where the casino was. So the casino becomes a Baptist college. And the tunnels are still there. When did that casino go away? When did it uh, 19, uh, 19, I'm going to say approximately 1950, right about that time. But I, it, went, yeah, was, I went to Dallas Seminary, too, from 85. To oh, now. wow. I finished that myself, too. So. Yeah, so were you back in the time when you had to wear a suit to class and all that? No, not, that, that, was, that was way before me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there was a time, you know, you had to wear a suit. By the, by the way, what did you get your degree in over there at, at Dallas Theological? Uh, uh, pastoral counseling. Oh. He was a master of theology, the emphasis in pastoral counseling. And if you don't mind my asking, what denominational background were you when you came into Dallas Theological? Uh, I came out of a 
independent Baptist church. I went to Baptist University in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Ah. It was an independent Baptist. You know, they broke off from Southern Baptist. Yes. They broke off from Southern Baptist and became independent Baptist. Right. So that's what I was. Yeah. Yeah, that, uh, there were several break off of Norris's uh, group in Fort Worth. And, uh, and those break-offs, some of them became more important, you know, than the original seminary. Yes, sir, go ahead. I have a friend who lives up in Commerce and has been having for some years now a real run-in with uh, government officials up there. And she has found, and I'm wondering if you're familiar with this, that that whole government structure up there is largely run by the Masons and the Klan. Mm -hmm. Very, very prolific, very active up in, up in Hunt County. Hmm. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, again, the client exists, but it's very, very marginalized these days. Oh, further, yeah. I would suggest that anybody interested in learning more about the clan, Eustace Mullins wrote a book called Curse of Canaan, mm -hmm. and it uh, goes into how the clan, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, not the clan, the Masons, yeah. have been involved in revolutions all over Europe and also here in the United States mm. for centuries. Well, yeah, most specifically the American Revolution, and uh, very heavily Masonic uh, leadership. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I was just wondering about, I know when I moved to Texas, there was a racetrack. I think was it in Grand Prairie, maybe? No, it was Arlington. Arlington. Arlington yeah. Downs. Arlington Downs. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one Norris Close. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, yeah, and uh, then, you know, <laughs> Only in more recent times have we had the one in Grand Prairie, Lone Star Park. Park. Yeah. Is that the only, that's the only one in Texas? Mm -hmm. Everybody get cake? Woo! Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any more? It's out there. Very good. Go get it. <laughs> Those of us that never use anything. <laughs> okay, are we done with Q and A now? No, I don't know. Are we all done with Q and A? Yes, we are. Uh, okay. We get to sit down for a minute, and then I come okay. back. There's yeah. cake. Oh, there's my cake. Okay, good. Thank you. Can I have a place for you to sit? Oh, thank you. Let's see if my drink is still back here. Now it's your turn to talk. So come on up here. Whoever wants to <coughs> say whatever they want to concerning what the speaker has talked about, either for or against. So you have five minutes. That's it. Gosh, I took so many notes, I don't know if I can do it in five minutes. Uh, my brother-in-law's father, <clears throat> whom I used to know in the 60s, and I think he passed away in the 70s, this teaches you how recent this history is. He used to drive cattle from his ranches in South Texas to Fort Worth on horseback. I mean, you couldn't possibly do that today with all the roads. Uh, <clears throat> years ago, this is kind of funny, I was working for a company and there were some guys in from Germany who were interested in buying some products and I speak German so I was asked to take them to lunch and we went to the reunion tower so that we could have them see all of Dallas as it revolved around. Well we got up there and a cloud had settled down on the whole city so we couldn't see anything. Pretty soon one of them held up this blank sheet of white paper and handed it over to me and I said, what is that? He said, it's a picture of Dallas. <laughs> I had these friends. Uh, one thing I think about Dallas that uh, might be true, back then there were no trains, there were no cars, there, were, there was no transportation except on horseback and covered wagon. So flat land was very useful for that kind of transportation. And I think because of all of this central Texas area, that Dallas was kind of a crossroads of a lot of people going here and there through those years. And that's one reason I think that Dallas grew the way it did. I had two friends. I went to college up in Illinois. We moved down here in about 62, and I, I was traveling back and forth by car. And I can remember coming over a hill just south of uh, Denton, and the first thing we would see in the middle of the night is the mobile flying horse. Oh, yeah. Now, that was the highest thing in Dallas. Well, what now it's way down in the valley between all those buildings, which is kind of sad in a way. Uh, my senior year, I played football up there, and uh, they had spring training, which uh, the kids who were going to be there the next year would uh, attend. And there were two guys from Dallas who had been accepted as freshmen up in this little college, 
and they wanted to play football, so the coach asked me if I would bring them back from spring vacation so they could do the spring training. I said, sure. Well, these guys, they knew Texas was flat, I guess, because I don't think they'd ever seen a hill. They, uh, they were so excited. One of them was sitting on the passenger seat, and the other, this is 700 mile drive. The other was in the back seat, leaning over the seats, and they were asking me questions the whole time. And so we get up towards southern uh, Missouri, and it's beginning to get hilly and so forth, and the roads are curving through the hills. And I thought I would tell them this uh, legend, a little bit enhanced. There was, uh, at Alton, Illinois, there was a big cliff area, and they had a big bird painted up there called the Piasaw Bird, and it was this legendary bird that would come down and steal children out in the play yard and this and that and the other. And the Indians were always fighting it. So I thought I would tell them the legend of this bird. <coughs> and I called it Falling Rock. And so the legend was, as I was telling them, that this, well, the bird's name wasn't Falling Rock. This warrior's name was Falling Rock. That he decided he was so sick of these children being lost that he dressed up like a little kid and was playing out in the field like a kid and the bird came down, the piasaw, and grabbed him and he pulled out his hatchet and he was swinging and fighting the piasaw as they flew off, flew off and he was saying, I will return, I will return. So the legend of, of Falling Rock is, watch for Falling Rock. And they even put up signs in, in Missouri about that. We go around the corner right then and here's this road sign that says, watch for falling rock. And I said, you see, there's one now. Golly! They were so excited about that. Well, that was the last I said about it, and that was in the spring. That next fall, I had a three-month tour in Europe with the college I went to. So I was not available, and I came back for Christmas, and uh, Ron White called me up and said, Albert, Mike and I want to have a conversation with you. <laughs> they got up there two weeks early to football camp, so they were there ahead of all of the other students, and they knew a little more, and they were going to tell some of the things to these young, wide-eyed students. So they told the legend of Falling Rock. Um, let me see what else. Uh, you talked about languages and extermination of tribes here. I, I remember reading a long time ago that it's estimated that in, the, in, in North America, before the white man came, there were 20, some 2,500 separate languages. Not just dialects of languages, but separate languages. And they're virtually all gone today. Um, I remember reading about the Titanic. You mentioned the tit some of the Titanic. Actually, the Titanic had a sister ship, and that sister ship, I forget the name of it, Olympia. Olympia. Olympia, was in terrible physical condition, and there was so much that had to be done to it that they thought it was not economically feasible even to fix the ship, so they switched the names and sent the Titanic out, and it sank, actually the Olympia. There was a lot more to that Titanic sinking than people think. There were, there were a lot of people who were politically unfavorable to the Federal Reserve and things like that who went down with that ship. Five minutes? Okay. Oh, i got to tell one more story. There was a building that was built in the early 60s down in Dallas, a big high rise. And they had a sunken area in the middle of the building where they were going to put all the air conditioning and heating system, which was tons of equipment. And they got this building pretty well erected, and then they realized, oh my God, we haven't put this equipment in there yet. Yeah. And they could, the engineers all stood around and they talked and they could not figure, they couldn't get a train in there, they couldn't get anything in there that could drop this equipment down. And this one man had his little boy with him, and it was like on a Saturday, and he was holding on to his dad. Dad's hand. He said, Daddy, I know how to do it. And he quiet, son. And, but Daddy, I know how to do it. And after a while, all the engineers couldn't think of anything further. And he said, Daddy, I know how to do it. Be quiet, son. And one of the engineers said, No, listen, we're, we're out of ideas. Let the boy express his thought. And so the little boy said, Get blocks of ice and fill up that hole up to the floor level here push that machine out over that ice and then pump out the water as it melts and that's exactly how they did it. 
interesting. There are a lot of little stories like that. I made a whole list of them. Too bad. <laughs> hardly keep his mouth shut tonight. I think our speaker knows that I enjoy the subject. And you guys who maybe not lived here all your life don't really you can't really appreciate how well he has studied and learned what Dallas is all about and the uh, vast factual spread of information he's given to us tonight. We've really been treated. Uh, you will leave tonight knowing a lot more. And, you know, we could tell stories until the end of time. I think I just want to mention one or two things and I'll shut up. <coughs> Our speaker talked about the uh, Jewish people becoming big in the retail business. And as a child growing up, all the shopping was downtown. Uh, we lived down past the Forest Avenue Street then. And my parents, grandparents, went to Forest High School, which is Madison now. A uh, streetcar ran the door from our house, and we hop on the streetcar and go downtown. Anyway, been in all those retail stores downtown. And, and, and Adolphus Bush also built a big office building on the back side of the hotel, the Adolphus Tower. The Kirby building diagonally across the street. Beautiful ornate building that they preserved and I believe is now housing. Uh, was built there. Greyhound headquartered in it for a number of years. And so a lot of those people who've come to Dallas, uh, it's hard really when you look back at the quality <coughs> of the people who have immigrated here and made contributions, it's just hard to imagine that this flat spot on the prairie would be the magnet that would bring them here. But they were wise people and they saw opportunity and they took advantage of it. I've spoken to this subject before. You cannot even imagine the contribution that the Jewish community has made to this city. They've been less visible, perhaps, uh, than they could be. But down in the area of South Dallas that I lived in until I was in second grade and we moved out here near White Rock Lake at the bathhouse area. Um, the synagogue, which is at Hillcrest and Northwest Highway, was down in our neighborhood. Half my class, half my neighbor's friends went to the Jewish school and the other half of us went to Colonial Elementary or John Brown Elementary. He lived over a block or two. Our neighbors across the black the back fence, black fence. The back fence were black. They were Afro Americans. That was the beginning of the South Dallas black community out on the south side of our property. And uh, my father and his family farmed before you went across uh, White Rock Creek on 2nd Avenue. Irrigated farms, they grew a lot of the produce that went into Dallas. But I'm just, I'll go back to downtown. If you went and looked at all the retail stores downtown, uh, Sanger Harris was mentioned, Sanger Brothers, A. Harris, uh, Ian Cog, Volk Brothers, all those stores were Jewish sponsored and owned companies. And guess what the most famous one of all was? Neiman Marcus. Uh, they brought a quality to Dallas and an attitude. You know, Herbert, the Marcus brothers and the children had an attitude, the customer is always right. And they served customers even if they just came in with barely enough money to buy what they were going to buy, they treated them like kings and queens. Amazing. And that magnetized and it brought a lot of people to come to Dallas to shop. And then if you left the immediate downtown area with the 
buildings that were large, and you went out along Elm, Elm Street before you got to Deep Ellum, all the little bitty stores were Jewish owned. I've walked in and out of them with my family a lot. They made a fantastic contribution. The president of Republic Bank, right before the collapse of the banks in 88, was a Jewish gentleman. Fine, fine manager of a bank. And we had a lot of people moving here from New York who were ethnically Jewish. And we had a wonderful article, probably around about six, seven pages in the D Magazine a number of years ago. And they talked about how the Jewish community came and talked to him. I can still see his face. I can't say his name right now. And they said, why are you so friendly to the non-Jewish population? He said, you know, in New York, we go run our stores, we go work in our law office, we go draw buildings in the, in the architectural firm, and then we retreat to the Jewish community. We don't socialize with those people. He said, well, guess what? Those people are the ones who put the money in my bank, they make my bank run, and I'm gonna join their clubs, and I'm gonna support their causes, and I'm gonna participate. He had exactly the same attitude as the Marcus family did. And we have all very much profited from the people who come to Dallas. The creators who came to TI, some of which were recruited up in Illinois, came out down to what was in GSI, Geophysical Services Inc. over on Lemon Avenue, or they ever got up there on Central at LBJ. Fantastic engineers. Uh, if you, I would hesitate to try to count the number of patents that have come out of that company. And for them to be no bigger than they are, they've been some of the greatest creators, starting with Kilby creating the, the semiconductor chip uh, that's in so much of our equipment now that's been so vastly improved, not just by them, but by everybody. We've really been blessed with technology and things that don't have anything to do with drilling a hole in the, in the earth to take out oil. We had companies here, but no oil operations until they started doing the, uh, fracking. the fracking and the horizontal drilling. Uh, we've been so very fortunate to have the kind of people come here to our city and do things with a blah Nothing spot on the prairie, thank goodness. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to make a, a quick note about uh, uh, some friend, a friend was throwing out a book. The cover was completely destroyed and not all the pages were there. But it was about the uh, Indian Wars in Texas. And, um, <laughs> you know, we, we can mourn over the loss of the indigenous population you also need to hear what the settlers here face and and what kind of challenges they had um, in the movies we have you always have the uh, the troops coming over the uh, ridge you know to drive the indians out when most of these accounts where the indians would come through they'd lay waste to farmhouses and literally the neighbors would get together they'd be outnumbered massively by the Indians. They'd go track the Indians down and start uh, engaging them in battle until the rest of their neighbors could catch up. And they'd, be, they'd already have everybody basically routed or killed before the uh, military ever got there. And in so many cases, so many accounts. And you realize why uh, um, maybe we don't think we need to be an armed population anymore. Uh, I mean, there are arguments on both sides of that. I still uh, am a supporter of the Second Amendment, but when you understand what those people went through, uh, what the settlers went through back then, many of the children were just outright killed. They sometimes take the women with the uh, war party, and then they find the women dead later on. Uh, it was. It was really a very, uh, 
very challenging uh, bear here in Texas. And um, so uh, that's another side of the story. Now, also, I had some uh, Jewish friends that uh, the family, uh, Sherry Greenberg, her father was in involved in what she called the textile industry yeah. here in Dallas. And I don't know if that's different from from the retail, but uh, it cut sounded and sew. from it what cut and sew the cut and sew and uh, and so that was also a very going thing until um, what what was it happened when they shut down the cotton fields? Um, there was a, a point uh, was it between the wars coming after World War Two or something? Was like, well, they were still growing it after World War Two? They were maybe that was the uh, road. There were gods of Maybe that was the hemp I was thinking about. There was, uh, <laughs> because that was, I think, part of the, at one point, it wasn't that part of the textile industry here, too? Yeah, okay. Well, as you know, I was, uh, um, Xerox came to, to London to hire people, engineers, and so I wound up in. Rochester, New York. I think the first glimpse I got of Dallas was um, in the opening credits to the film Mid Midnight Cowboy with Dustin yeah. Hoffman. But I never dreamt I'd, uh, I'd come to Dallas. That was the furthest place in my. Uh, they had a sort of a bad reputation where they sort of assassinated presidents and so on. So um, it sort of put a cloud over it. Well, um, we, um, so we lived up in Rochester for six years. We never did buy a house because um, after about two years we decided we'd buy a house and they said, well, our division is going to move across the other side, the other side of Rochester, so we stopped. Then the next year they said, well, we've just bought this company called SDS out in El Segundo, California, and we're going to move out there to California to Palos Verdes. Had we done that, I'd be a millionaire, you know, having a small house on Palos Verdes, so we didn't go there. So then uh, next year they suddenly said, well, we, what we've decided to do, we want to be centrally located. So they opened up the map and they looked where the staples were. And one was in Chicago and the other was in Dallas. So they said, well, Chicago's, you know, frozen like uh, Rochester, so we, we'll go to Dallas. So. One uh, one fine day, we all arrived on the bus and toured around uh, Dallas. <clears throat> and I remember going past the waterfall uh, on on Stemmons, just north of downtown. And they said, "This is the biggest." You know, so we all cheered. Bye. <laughs> you know, anyway, so uh, so here we are in Dallas. So and so I've been here for about forty three years and uh, have never moved. Like the the division of the CPD. Um, we were actually in a political war with the West Coast, so um, so they moved the computer products uh, division, part of it, back to the uh, West Coast, and the rest they moved back to Dallas, but we decided to stay, so uh, we stayed. So I'm, I'm glad we did, because candidly, I didn't want to go and live in a rabbit hutch in California. Uh, I didn't want to go and freeze my rear end off back up in Rochester. And so uh, so that was it. So the another. A story has um, you mentioned the Cecils. Well, there's there's a common expression in England called Bob's your uncle, and everybody knows what it means. Has anybody, everyone heard of Bob's your uncle? So what does it mean? Well, I had to think a long time. You know, what, what does it really mean? Well, it means it's as good as done, and that actually uh, Bob refers to Lord, Lord Robert Cecil who was the head of the Conservative Party and a great nepotist. So if you were related to Robert Cecil, and Bob was your uncle, you'd, you'd immediately get a job that so you were in. And, and, and not many people in England know that. That was the origin of Bob's your uncle. Okay, so a few few factors. Anyway, it's been good in Dallas. We, we've enjoyed ourselves and uh, lived nicely, cheaply. It's, it's, been, it's been great. <laughs> I guess, oh, got another one. A couple more.
Years ago, I read a book, and I've also seen this man interviewed, and look up reverse speech analysis. To me, it's more accurate than polygraphs, but there was a thorough reverse speech analysis done of this man's presentation on, I think, Coast to Coast, and it was determined that everything he said was absolutely true. His name is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Philip Corso. He published a book called The Day After Roswell. And he was in charge of the, he was in Army Intelligence, the Army's limited portion of debris from the Roswell UFO crash in 1947. And his job was to take a shard and look at it and say, now is that going to be materials, technology, or electronics, or whatever. He seeded, if you read his book, he talks all about it. He seeded into our economy 38 different items that became part of the great surge that our economy had from the 50s and 60s. One of those was integrated circuits. The man out at TI who got the credit for that, that was a cover-up. That was from the Roswell UFO crash, that technology. Integrated circuits, uh, what is it, Kevlar fabrics, uh, a whole lot of things, 38 different things. The Day After Roswell is the book, and it's fascinating reading. You mentioned wooden shoes. Uh, in the 60s, I spent some time in Denmark, and I learned that the nurses there were all required to wear wooden shoes because they were sculpted to the shape of the foot, and a person tired much slower when they were wearing those wooden shoes than they did leather shoes. They were actually required to do that in Denmark, in the hospitals. Uh, let's see. Well, that's about it. Let's... Uh, when we moved here in the early 60s, Dallas was extremely dry, very arid, and we would have two or three weeks of maybe spring and then hot summer, two or three weeks of fall and then cold winter. I remember as much as 10 inches of snow. Since then, you mentioned there was one natural lake, Lake Cato. All of these lakes were put in as water reservoirs plus tens of thousands of swimming pools all of this evaporation has is, is now created a very humid uh, environment that we have here. And it's very unfortunate. I remember back in the 60s, I went over to see a friend of mine and, uh, in Highland Park, and he wasn't there. And his dad said, hey, I know this neat little town way out in the country where we can go get a, a soda. They have a neat little soda fountain. So we got in his car, and we drove way out in the country. And there was this little brick street place with a few blocks, and we had a nice soda. Place called Plano, Texas. <laughs> I guess it looks like I'm the last one standing. All right, I want to thank our speaker. I think he did a fantastic job. I was all thinking that you, you gave us facts that we didn't know. It was great. It was a tremendous speech. I, I really got to hand it to you. It kept us in thrall. I even lost track of time. It was amazing. I normally don't do that. Anyway, uh, uh, I'm from Chicago, and, and uh, there's some correlation there. Chicago has, is the trail transportation hub of the world, they said. Uh, why? Why? Because of the lake, because of the way the geography is set up. And I think you, your premise today was, uh, why Dallas? Uh, well, Dallas, once you... As you mentioned, the water was here, and uh, the railroad needed water, you know, to run their trains, and so they made it, and this became the, the crossing point. So, as a result, it was a transportation hub. Uh, in the early 60s, I remember, there was a friend of mine, he's dead now, but he was in charge of Braniff Information Reservations in Chicago. And he took me out for lunch, and he had three martinis, I think, and he went back to work, and they said his name is Morford, he's dead now. But anyway, they said, Mr. Morford, there's a woman on the phone here. She wants to go to Kansas City. She's all upset. There's no plane direct to Kansas City. We got on the phone and he, he, he stood there in the office. Everybody could hear him. He said, all roads lead to Dallas. He says, if you want to go to, Dan, if you want to, go to Kansas City, he says, you must go to Dallas first. He said, sell her a ticket to Kansas City by way of Dallas. Was it? Anyway, it, it's sort of, this is a transportation hub, and I think that's why Dallas is where it is today. And I think that's why everything grew here, and that's why people make decisions to come here. 
because in industry in different places they have they can get their they get their manufacturing they get their product in they get their product out and they can do it cheaper than anywhere else plus uh, this is a right to work state which means that labor costs are cheaper here so therefore corporations want to come here and uh, that's if we lose that factor the corporation will stop coming here believe it and uh, I'm from Chicago I watch them leave so it's it's something that to consider Anyway, I think our speaker did a great job, and you get to, and Mr. Speaker, you get to comment on the comment now and close the meeting. You get the last word. <laughs> Tom, thank you very much. I uh, want to, first of all, thank you, Tom, and the group for continuing this extraordinary opportunity to talk about things you can already talk about anywhere else. Yeah. And uh, this is a real special, uh, unique uh, group. And I've always enjoyed uh, coming, and I wished I'd been coming many, many years earlier. Uh, look forward again to hopefully coming next year. I, I just had one comment. Um, a number of years ago, we had a famous writer from New York City named John Simon. He was very well-known uh, film critic and uh, in the New York Times and in the New Yorker magazine and so forth. And uh, we had him at our school and uh, he, uh, we asked him, um, is there anything in Dallas you want to see? You know, everybody wants to go see the assassination site and all that. He said, no, there's just one place I want to go. Where's that? I want to go to Neiman Marcus. Yeah. <laughs> In New York, they've all heard about Neiman Marcus. It reminded me of what my daughter said. She said that she lived in New York for a number of years. And uh, in recent years, she'd say, well, you're we from, from Texas. Oh, do you, do you know Chip and Joanne in, uh, in Waco? You know, Chip and Joanne are the have a program called the Fixer Upper, yeah. and it's the number one home and garden program in the nation. And they, it, it is astonishing to people in New York because they'll buy a piece of property, an old house for say 100,000, they'll spend 50,000 up on it and turn for 150,000, that's like Taj Mahal. And people are up there, you mentioned about living in a cubby hole in California. People on these coasts, they look and they say, my God, you, you live in a mansion for peanuts and, in Texas. And uh, there's a lot to be said about this theme that uh, you get more for less in Texas. And I think this is, um, I've always thought I was very lucky to get a job in Texas to come here. I've been well paid as a teacher, but, but that money goes a lot farther here than it would if I were in New York or California. And, um, and I think we sometimes belittle that when in fact that's a really a great advantage. Uh, land is cheaper here, water is available here, um, energy is available here, and, uh, and the most important thing is I think this idea that it doesn't matter who you are in Dallas, if you come here, you have an idea, and it's a good one, you take off, nobody asks you where you're from, where you've been, who your family is. You go to Europe, they all know their family trees back for 20 generations, right? Most of my students can't tell me, give me a four generation family tree. That's not necessarily a good thing, but on the other hand, this idea that it's always about now and the future. It's not about history. And I think that's one thing that's very primarily true in Texas. Texas is the least stuck. We have a lot of history here and a lot of heritage. But I think people aren't stuck on the idea that you're from such and such a family. If, you, if, you're, if you're wanting to go to work, the opportunities here are incredible, uh, as good as anywhere. And if, particularly if you're an entrepreneur. And many entrepreneurs have come here and done well. So uh, we live in a, in, in my opinion, a blessed place, a very special place. And, uh, but it all eventually all comes down to the people and attitudes. And Dallas has always been a very inclusive place. Everybody's welcome here. 
and uh, it, it wasn't always that way, but I think it is a place where, uh, come on, come all, we don't, we don't want to, uh, we want you if you have something to contribute, and I think that's uh, one of the hallmarks of, of this great uh, city and the great state of Texas. So thank you for having me, and uh, Tom, I look, hope you're back again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's it for the formal meeting. Uh, the kick is out here at 10.30. If you want some more cake, it's out there. And uh, uh, our speaker is walking to stick around and talk about it. See y'all, and we won't have any meeting next week. Our next meeting is January 6th. I will do that. Oh, that's right. Tom? Oh, good. See you next year. Take care. See you next year. Uh, you want to be a... I'm still looking for a speaker from January 6th.